Welcome to my podcast, Today's Dream, Tomorrow's Reality. My name is Vicki Poole. I'm a life coach, health coach, and a hypnotist at the Enlightened Peach. And this podcast is all about embracing our mosaic life. Some of you may ask, what is a mosaic life? Well, it's recognizing that all the pieces of our life, the good, the bad, the indifferent, have all come together to make us who we are. Change any one thing and we are different. With that in mind, I invite you to embrace your perceived imperfections and celebrate who you are. This podcast is unedited and raw, just like life. And I am your host, and I have a special guest with me today. I'll introduce you in just a moment. But if you have any ahas or questions, please leave a comment or a voice message. And remember to like, subscribe, and share. So now let's get started. And this beautiful lady right here is Brianne, Brianne Moore. And she's actually been on the podcast once before, but I will be honest, she was so intriguing and her story is so fascinating. Um, and and when I had it on, when I put it on my own YouTube channel, I will say she's the one that's gotten the most um, views and likes and everything because it's such an interesting story. She, um, uh, blah, 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 blah. there we go with the unediting part, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I will let you um, tell just a little bit of your story, if you don't mind, um, just a recap for everybody. And then we're going to, we're actually going today, we're going to dive in a little bit deeper into the subject we talked about last time. So floor is yours. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I am a, I, I guess at this point, I'm kind of shifted into an intimacy coach um, and fertility coach. And, but I have DID, uh, PTSD, and from severe childhood trauma and a lot of generational trauma that I have worked through with through the years. And so the most, majority of my story comes from that and having to deal with it over the last few years and, and working through it. But I do love working in the feminine energy fields. Um, and that's where my passion is but I also like talking about my situation because I think that it really helps people, especially women who have went through the kind of trauma that I have went through. Yeah. And you know, the, the sad thing is that you hear more and more about it all the time. Maybe they don't have the multiple personalities like you do, um, but they have a lot of trauma and especially with all this stuff that's coming out now about human trafficking and, um, and then the, um, um, I had one guest on my podcast. She was um, familiar trafficked. So it was a family member that was uh, trafficking her. And so that's not the same thing, you know, but it kind of in the same way is what you went yeah. through, right? Yes. Oh, Would absolutely. it be considered the same thing? Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, my family was the one that trafficked me. If, if you go about it that way, you know, yeah. my grandma definitely was the one and my aunt were the ones that gave me to other people or passed me to other people. So yeah, it's the same type of thing. Um, that actually, I believe is the biggest um, misconception about trafficking is most people think, oh, you have to be kidnapped and taken and whatever. But actually a lot of the times it's your own family that yeah. actually does that to you. Um, and a lot of times it's obviously in religious organizations that happens a lot because they have a hierarchy that they go through. Um, so for me, that was that was how it happened. And I think that happens a lot more than we actually think. And it doesn't have to necessarily be your parents because it wasn't my parents, but it can be you know a close friend or anyone that you feel really comfortable with who can use that power of being um, over you. And for mm -hmm. me, it was a power of not only being over me, but also you know the patriarchy, but the religious aspect and really learning they know how to like shame you and make you feel bad so you never say anything you know and it's interesting because the the last time we talked I thought for sure I was going to get a lot of messages from family and I haven't gotten really any messages from very few people in my family um most won't acknowledge it you know but my dad's family who's not the family that happened and I got a lot of from them they're saying, how, how did we not know? How did we not know? Oh, wow. Just, that's just 
Yeah. How, how did it feel more. for them to reach out and say that? You know what? I always want, I, I always feel bad for some reason and want to be like, it's not your fault. You didn't know it's not your fault. But I'm like, I mean, I, I was really good at, at covering it up, obviously. Mm -hmm. And, um, really good at holding everything in in fact the the last the the message that you sent me that someone had put on the the youtube channel mm -hmm. was actually a cousin that i who was my best friend when we were growing up until about i don't know maybe like 16 ish we kind of drifted apart um and we were inseparable and, and she messaged me and she was like how did i not know this and i'm like i don't i don't know like i I inside I felt like everyone knew that I was bad that I was a horrible person that was doing these horrible things but obviously I guess no one knew and I I carried it all as like it was me being the bad person you know and so we, we actually ended up talking for the first time in 25 years oh because how cool. of channel. yeah so that was Yay. pretty awesome yeah, because we hadn't talked in so long and she she reached out and I was like, okay, we need to talk. And and so that was great. I mean, there's some good things that come with sharing your story, even though it's scary. Yeah. yeah. And like I was telling you, I don't remember what I said last time um, because I disassociated the majority of the time. So if you saw who I was, then you would know like that that was a multiple, but you just can't tell really the difference, you know? Yeah. Very, yeah. Very well, you did message me um, later, I think after I had sent you the links and everything that you were kind of uncomfortable about sharing this out. Yeah. Um, and it I said, well, to, yeah. to get comfortable. And yeah, I bet, especially like since you don't remember what was said, you know? Well, for sure. There was a point where I was like, was I like, what did I say? What did I do? I, my husband watched, watched it <laughs> to check because I couldn't watch it because it gave me anxiety. So he watched it. He was like, you're fine. I'm like, okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> At one point, and I don't remember what it was you were talking about, but you said, I don't think I've told anybody else this. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't know if it was when your grandmother grabbed your hand and did something or whatever it was, but um, I'd have to go back and watch again to see. But afterwards, you told me that you you hadn't really said that to anybody, or maybe yeah. you said it in the actual recording. I can't remember, but I thought that was kind of interesting. But you know, I just I just alluded to the the lady that I did the podcast recording with that said she was familiar trafficked or trafficked familiar, however you say it. Um, and interestingly enough, it was her mother. Um, it wasn't, she didn't do it so much as that she allowed it to happen with this boyfriend because the boyfriend was paying the bills. Mm -hmm. And so I can kind of see sometimes, you know, that could be part of it is people learned how to control someone because they've got the purse strings, you know? Yes. Oh, you absolutely. Know? Yeah. Um, I mean, my aunt, she would take me to a jewelry store and I don't know if I told the story already. Um, she would take me to a jewelry store so she could get jewelry and I would have to take care of the person so she could get jewelry. But then I got a ring afterwards. So it was like, oh, well, you get something, you know? And there was there was that for sure. It's yeah. the, the money, definitely. Um, but not for my parents. I mean, my, my parents were didn't get anything or anything like that. It was... It was my grandpa, you know, he was, was a, a Mormon businessman, I could say. And that was kind of how he was. He, um, I think that has a lot to do with how he, how our family was raised in the church and, and how generation after generation of trauma. And I was talking to my sister yesterday and I, and we were just like, how did this keep happening? And, and it, to me, it always comes down to the women in my family because all the women, it's like no empathy or no caring because it happened to them. It's like, well, it happened to so-and-so, so you'll be okay. Instead of saying, well, it happened to so-and-so, so maybe don't let me go with that person. Like, don't let your kids be around that person because right. so, so is not a good person. So that's just not the way it worked. It was more like, oh, well, you know, yeah. it happened to so-and-so, so, so you, you'll be okay. You'll be okay afterwards. It's a well, very you know, there, there are a lot of um, studies and all done that 
people that are abusers or sexual abusers or physical abusers or were that they were abused when they were young. And so it's just something that I don't, I don't understand it. If it's that suddenly because they've experienced that, that's just a normal part of life and they don't see that it's, you know, something wrong with it. Or if they do see that they're just not willing to, um, breach protocol or to call somebody out or it's easier to just keep silent yeah or cause family drama yeah yeah cause any drama like my family was all about trying to look like there was a perfect family right so that that doesn't help you know if you're if you're causing any kind of drama and so yeah yeah for sure I think that a lot of people just they just stay quiet because it just they, they don't know what to say. I don't know. Like even now when my family is, is kind of, some are talking to me, some are not talking to me. And I can tell like some don't know what to say, even though they don't really need to say anything, I guess. But right. most of them are just like, what do I say? You know, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't know. But it's hard for me because I really feel like the majority of my mom's family probably knew. They just don't want to admit it. Yeah, it's so like basically they're saying- I'm sorry I didn't do anything. Yes. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Would that make you feel better if they said that instead of, I didn't know? Probably. Honestly, the one thing with my mom is that, is that like, I would like her to say, I'm sorry, I did, I didn't do anything instead of saying I didn't know, because her thing is always that she didn't know. And to me, there's no way that she didn't know. So it would be better if she just said, I'm sorry, I didn't do anything. I'm sorry, I didn't protect you. I'm sorry yeah. that I failed that part of whatever. And then we could probably move move forward. But the whole like, well, I didn't know just makes it so that she doesn't have hold any accountability, you know? And so that's always hard for me. Yeah, and, and you wonder if you didn't know, then there has to be in the quiet of the night or sometime when you're not putting up your pretenses as a little kid, that she would have to know something was up, you know? Oh, there were lots of signs. Let me, yeah. I mean, I started my period at eight years old. I went to the doctor at that time. You know, they did an exam. So you know that they knew. Um, I mean, there's just, there's so many times. I mean, I told- I'm, I, I imagine I it was like a, a church doctor, right? So he wouldn't say anything anyway. Was it not? Well, he How was did- a- he was a family friend. Yeah. Okay. But not much on the side of the church. So I don't know. It's so well, weird. Like, he, you know, he could have been, I, I'm just saying somebody that's part of the church yeah. that was the doctor. And then mm. because he would be more apt to keep the secrets. Mm. Um, oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and I went to the bishop many times in the Mormon church and you have to do an interview And if he was really called by God and like had all the discernment and all the things that you're supposed to have being, you know, then he would know that I was lying to all the questions that he was asking. Cause Mormon, they ask you when you're a little kid, if you've had sex, like a question that an adult male should never ask a girl by herself in a room by themselves at 12 years old, right? They ask you, have you ever had sex? And I would have to say, no, you know, but if they were really, they should be able to discern, like, I mean, I'm freaking out inside. I feel like I'm going to like, you know, have a heart attack and God is definitely going to like destroy me for lying to the bishop. So he should have known, like he should have seen it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't know. And and I did say other things to the bishops that were never brought up because where I lived and, and this is another interesting thing is since I've been sp- speaking out, a lot of women from my, what they call a ward, which is a mm-hmm. whole group that comes in an area have come forward and told me, oh my gosh, do you know all the people that were doing things that they weren't supposed to be doing? And, and all the young kids that were having like sex and everything. And I'm like, yeah, it was very, I mean, for a religion that it, you're not supposed to have sex until you're married, everybody's having sex. Like, it's just so weird because there's this whole back thing about abuse that's hidden and then all these kids are abused and then they all have sex with each other and it's just this whole cycle that makes you feel horrible and then they tell you every Sunday how you're going to hell if you have sex before you're married and so you're just like spinning and feel like you're you're never gonna you know be in the right place and at some point you might even be thinking you know well 
I'm already going to hell. So oh, it, for just sure. go ahead and have fun. For sure. <laughs> but at a certain point, I was addicted to sex, mm-hmm. you know, at a very young age because, because of just having sex and then being like overly stimulated as a child. And then with the DID and everything, it's actually having an orgasm, even to this day, helps bring me into my body because I disassociate helps me bring me into my body and it helps like regulate me like I get a regulation and a dopamine hit that I am very addicted to even today like I'm not as bad today like um because I've done a lot of work on it but forever I mean I had severe like and most women won't, I mean, most people won't talk about this, but it's always a man's problem. It's always like, oh, men are addicted to porn and whatever. I had a huge porn issue when I was first married because I needed it all the time. Like I needed to have like all the time I needed to have an orgasm all the time in order to even just cope. So, I mean, I had a huge problem with it when I was in my twenties. Um, really bad caused a lot of problems with me and my husband for a lot of years because I just was constantly over aroused you know right right it's it's but I didn't see it like I never saw it you just thought it was a healthy sex sex well I knew I was I knew it was like over the top (laughs) but I didn't think like I didn't see what it was like like that it was because of what I had went through as a child Ah, that it was because of being like in PTSD the majority of the time and that it it regulates me and it helps you know all those I didn't realize any of that until I got into energy work and started doing all my healing that oh okay this is this is getting giving me a dopamine hit this is giving me you know this is regulating my body and all of these things which is good but at the same time, you can't obviously can't do it all the time and you can't be overstimulated 24 7 because then I'm never in my body like it's so hard to find a a balance of Mm -hmm. staying in in it and then like but not having to be like aroused all the time it's a really weird like balance game of stay present but don't get excited (laughs) no no it's yeah yeah so I'm just curious is it in some ways and this may not be you it may be people that you know about I don't know but is it some ways that maybe after a while it gets to be that's where the the only close place you get is during the the sex act and so you start you start craving that because it's what makes you feel like somebody cares um no because at that time like all of those things it's really by myself it's just okay. I, and you did have of- like some very physically abusive sexual encounters if I'm remembering it's, right in the beginning. So yeah, forget yeah. I said that. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Yeah. So, so t- personally, I like, I mean, me and my husband have a very good relationship that way. Um, a very strong connection, but we do a lot of energy work together and stuff. Now we didn't for years, but we've been together for 25 years. So, um, but if, for that time, like when I was like totally addicted and totally all that, it was just me personally. Like I, I couldn't even be around anyone or have anyone touch me. I'm not a hugger. Okay. Like I just, it right away when someone hugs me, I disassociate. Like, so, so having someone touch me is not, not going to happen, but touching myself is like a, a freedom, I guess, I or guess something you. that it yeah. helps soothe me. Maybe I, wasn't very soothed probably as a child to be honest my mom was probably just whatever and so like it's just a calming soothing relaxing thing that would that would help me even at I mean the youngest I can remember like it starting to be a thing was I don't know eight maybe and it was just all the time so it was just something that obviously like soothed me and helped me feel better but I had no idea what like why I guess until Mm -hmm. I was later okay well I know when we had talked before you were talking about how you one of the things that you help women with is that if they're infertile um because a lot of that comes from wound trauma like what you had can you maybe 
um, elaborate on that a little bit more because we just we didn't touch on it very yeah. much. And yeah. I know that's that's part of what you do. And it's fascinating to think that that could be what's holding some women back from getting pregnant. Yeah. So a lot of times we if you've had any trauma, but not even trauma, like you started your period and it wasn't a good experience, like, you know, your mom and your dad, whoever didn't support you or something happened, you hold all those memories usually in that area, in the womb. And so we need to clear all of the energies out and go through all of the things that happen. So I always do like, well, what was your first experience like? Your first sexual experience? What was your first time having a, a period like? Because all those things need to be revisited because it's not just about whether or not your womb is healthy physically, but it's also mentally. Like, is your mm -hmm. womb healthy mentally? Does it want to? So there was years where obviously I didn't want to get pregnant because I was young and I knew that I could get pregnant, but I didn't want to. So I spent a lot of years going, well, I don't want to get pregnant. I don't want to get pregnant. I don't want to get pregnant. And then got married and was like, well, now I can't get pregnant. So how come? But I had spent all those years saying, I don't want to, you know what I mean? So I had to like clear all of that out. And it's the, it's a, most of the time us women, we do it a lot, especially around our periods. Like we hate having our period. It's such like, uh, I don't want to have it. And all of those things tell your body that, you know, well, I don't want to have children basically. And so we have to go back and reprogram everything. And, um, it's the best work, I think, because there's nothing better than having someone like tell you, oh, I got pregnant. And you're like, yes, you know, and I don't know. It's just it's beautiful to think that you can go through and clean something that you might think that is like so had so much trauma that it's not possible. And that's what I thought for like a lot of years, like, oh, it's just not possible. And then I changed because I thought, because I started doing all the work in healing and going, okay, well, it is possible. And I am worthy because a lot of it has to do with worth. A lot of what we, us women hold in our womb is our worth. And so that's, we really have to come back to feeling like you deserve to be a parent and you deserve to have children, which for some reason, for most women is really is a hard thing. I don't know why, like we just, we feel like we don't deserve that. And even when we have kids and half the time we feel like, oh my gosh, I'm not a good mom. So like, it's yeah. just, it's just oh, like we can beat know? ourselves up. Oh my lot, gosh, can't for we? sure. And it, <laughs> but it, but we hold it, you know, yeah. now if you beat yourself up and you let it go, like, okay, I was a really crappy mom today and I'm just going to like beat myself up about it. But then tomorrow is a new day. Like I'm going to like, whatever, then that's fine. But if you hold it in constantly forever, like I don't deserve to this, or, you know, I'm not worthy of this, then your body just goes, okay, well, that's fine. You know, yeah, you, don't, yeah. you don't need it. You don't have to be it. And we convince ourselves too, that we don't. Um, so I like telling women, like the other day I was at the park and, um, I, and this mom was there and she, her kids were older than my kids because I have a 11 and a, and a three and a two-year-old and she's like oh I think about having another one but I'm too old and I'm like you are not too old and she's like oh I'm too old I'm 32 I'm like I didn't even have my first one until I was 33 and I have these two babies and I'm 44 she's like really and I'm like yeah you can have them it's just whether or not you want to like yeah. if you you're not too old you will are not, we're told that we're too old, but actually a lot of times I think when the older you get, the better, like I, I'm more capable now. I don't know that I could handle the little two, two year old, the two of them when I was in my twenties and I was full on disassociated the whole entire time and had no idea what, who I was or what my life was, um, would have been a lot harder. So yeah. I think for some women, it does come later. And we have this whole idea about how at a certain age you're too old. And I love telling people, well, you're not too old. If you don't, if you want them, if you don't want them, then that's totally fine. Yeah. That's a totally different you story. Want, yeah. But if you want to have one and you're in your forties, go for it, you know, do Which it. Which is a good thing because a lot of women, brilliantly enough, are waiting till they're older to get married and to start yeah. a family. You know, yeah. they're not doing it. Like I got married on my, my 18th birthday. Was it 18th? 
Now, hell, I don't know. Was I 18 or 19? <laughs> you don't know. Hell, I don't yeah. evidently. Uh, <laughs> I think it was my 19th birthday. Who knows? Um, but anyway, I, but I waited um, five years before I had a child. And, you know, and I'll share one of the, we have some, at that age, we have some of the strangest ideas of things, right? So yeah. I decided that I was not going to have a baby right away because if I waited five years, then my marriage was solid and I was not going to get a divorce. And then it would be okay to have a baby. Mm -hmm. I got divorced while I was pregnant, you know? Yep. <laughs> so it's you like some, something about this does not compute, you know? <laughs> so at a young age, you know, we have the a weird way of looking at things and what um you know and how things are going to transpire and so it's amazing you know when we're young and these and things happen to us and as we're getting older not only is it better as far as being uh being able to be a parent when you're older but you've also worked through so much of your stuff that you can be a better parent because you're in a better place yeah. right yeah. Well, and I, I don't know if I told this last time or not, but like one of the worst parent things that I ever did was with my first and my grandpa was still alive. And I had such cognitive dissonance of like not paying attention, like just not thinking about what he did to me that I put my son and I allowed him to hold my son before he died. And to this day, I feel like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe. But if I was if he was alive right now with my youngest two, there is no way, you know what I mean? Because I went through it all. I remember, I, I dealt with it all. There's, there's no going back, but with my oldest son, I was still, I just started going through it. And so I just didn't really like think it was about still under I, the rug a little bit. Yes, totally. Yeah. And that's why I sometimes have to go to my family and go, okay, well, I understand because I did that. Look what I, I mean, I let my son sit on his lap. And that like to this day is still like, oh, I can't believe I did that, you know. But and on the other hand, did you leave the room and do all that stuff like your grandmother did? No. See? No. You didn't yeah. do anything wrong. No. Oh no. I mean, I was right there, but I didn't even think about it. Like I just was like, Oh yeah, he's coming over to visit. And you know, he's your grand, you know, great grandson. So of course you want to meet him. You know, I just didn't even think about it. So yeah that's just that's it's to me I, I still that's that's how I guess I have compassion for like some people where they're just like well you know like my mom I'm just like well okay I can see because she she's she has the same thing that I have I I honestly think that she has what I have and she just doesn't she just doesn't want to like go through and try to to figure it out she's never been diagnosed but she you know just is okay with not knowing she's okay yeah. with not remembering so. Yeah. Yeah. So when you think about that, what does that bring up for you? Anything that she just chooses to not remember? You know, it, it's hard. It's hard. Like we just, just don't have a relationship at the moment because of it. It's just it's not something that I can, it triggers too many things still. I would I'm imagine. just not there fully, you know, I'm not, I, I mean, I want to forgive because that's what I'm supposed to do, but I'm just not hundred percent there yet. So we just don't, we have a very like superficial, we text kind of, you know, relationship where we were very, very close for a lot of years. And so I knew when we moved to Oklahoma that we had to, cause she, we lived in the same city as her in Utah that I needed to get away so that I could finish like this healing and, and go through everything by myself. And then when a lot of stuff happened here and it just got so crazy, it was like, okay, I can't have a, a relationship with her like that right now. Like, it's just not, it's just not possible. And it's okay. I mean, eventually I don't know, maybe I, she says she doesn't want to know what happened to her as a child and she'll, she'll just find out when she dies. So that's her, that's her thing. And we might well, never be as close as we were. That's yeah. okay. Well, we have, have to make to our own up. choices, right? Yeah. I have to set a boundary of, yeah. you know, like I have to feel uncomfortable and I have to be able to stay. So, so now, because I'm really, really trying to stay a hundred percent like in my body, which is so hard when I talk to people that trigger me, I just can't talk to them because they, it's just too much, you know, yeah. I have 
be able to to not get that triggered so I can understand and there's that. Very few people that do that to me because the majority of the people that hurt me are dead and the other few that aren't I don't associate with so it's okay but you know I know that if my family came around and started saying stuff then I just would wouldn't talk to them you know yeah Nothing. yeah I don't really care that much actually I'm like well we didn't have that good of a relationship anyway so it's okay yeah. And I'm a firm believer just because somebody is born into your same little tribe doesn't mean they deserve your attention. Oh, for sure. Especially yeah. if, if they're not going to follow the boundaries that you set, or if they're not going to acknowledge what they stuff that they've done for sure. Yeah. 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 I'm like that now, but see, I wouldn't have been like that when I was younger. I would have just pretended like everything was perfect. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until just recently that I realized that pretending that everything perfect was literally destroying me, you know? So I just said, oh no, never mind. Like everything is hell. <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm just going to say it all now. And I let it all out and I don't care now. I'm like, I'm like, oh, well, you don't like it. It's okay. I don't care because holding it in and pretending everything was perfect, I wasn't going to last much longer. Like yeah. I just couldn't do. Well, I think one of the things that you said last time was you said you didn't know. And I, I wish I could remember exactly what you said. I should have went and rewatched it real quick before we got on here. <laughs> <laughs> I probably should have watched it, but it's okay. But you said something about how, um, let's see if I can remember how you put it. Um Damn. It was it was something about um how you couldn't understand why you were the one that had to have this experience to where you felt like you wanted to speak out because it was so uncomfortable to speak out. Um and I, I, I told you that it was because you were the, going to be the, God knew you were going to be the strong one and that you would speak out and break that generational curse that's been following your family for generations and that it was going to be you that would break that cycle. Yeah. Does and that I do sound right? That. Yeah. Yeah. And I do believe that. I believe that like they, that one of us had to do it. You know, and I do also believe very strongly that if one of us heals a, a generation, um, that it goes seven, seven back and seven forward. So I'll do it for everyone. I, I don't care. Like they don't have to do anything. They could just say I'm crazy and that I'm making it all up and whatever. And as long as their grandchildren don't have to go through what I went through, I don't care. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's the way that I've that I've looked, tried to look at it as much as possible, like going through it now, um, because it's important to, to heal, to heal what, what our family has done. Like it's, it's just so crazy and not good that it, it needs to come out. Like it needs to, I mean, it doesn't need to be like aired everywhere, probably according to my family, but, but <laughs> Like, why go small? I don't know. Yeah, like, just go, go for it. Um, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But it needs, it needs to come out because people need to know that this kind of stuff happens and that it can happen to someone that seems very normal. Like, I seem to like a normal kid with a normal life. And most of my friends will say, like, say that, like, that we're, that I grew up with, that we like, I had no idea. Like, you seemed, you know, like nothing was whatever. I obviously was very good at it. Like I, I'm very good at lying, I guess, you know, is, is well, you would is. have to have been because they probably told you um, like a lot of perpetrators do that your life or somebody else's life was in danger and that you don't tell your stuff kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. All of that, but mostly religious stuff because okay. that's where you really, you get the, that, you know, that is that, you know, God, you wanted this. And so you're, you know, God is going to be mad at you. You better do what you're supposed to do. I'm in charge, you know, all of that. And just the fact that it's someone that you 
you know, that you love and, and that you love, I guess, that you mm-hmm. listen to them because you, because you love them and you trust them. Right. And because you trust your parents and who are saying that these people are okay, you know, so, so you just, you just go along with it, you know, but, and it happens more than we know. And the interesting thing is there's, you know, I know for a fact that there's other cousins that, that it happened to because, because of, because I just know, you know, like, you, you know, one thing I, I'll, I've told people for a long time and I've told a lot of my clients is that there's definitely an energy, a trauma energy, right? And you can feel it when you've had it, you can feel it on other people. So I can walk into a room and I can tell you how many women in there have been sexually abused because I could just feel their energy. And that's how I've been for years. Like I just always know. And I always, because like energies attract like energies, the majority of my friends nowadays have had these kind of experiences because I attract them, you know, Mm -hmm. we, we attract the same thing. So it's very interesting because I believe that it, it creates an energy, but I also believe that that energy could be cleared and that we need to clear it because the more trauma that there is on earth or in our neighborhoods or anywhere, then it just keeps going and going and going. And we, we need to, to clear that out. You know, we need, we need to have good light energy, not, you know, this trauma, dark energy. Right. Well, with thinking about the fact that you were so good at covering it up, right? So what would let people know that something was going on? And before before you answer that, I'll tell you that, you know, I, the, I, I told you about the other lady that had the trafficking, the familiar trafficking. She actually goes and speaks to like um, the police department and UN and stuff, because at one point she was at her father's house which was a different home than her mother's. And she was staying there for a few days. And when her mom came to get her, she didn't want to go. And her dad said, she's going to stay here. And she went and got the cops. Well, the cops came and she's screaming and crying. You know, she doesn't want to go, but they didn't ask her any questions. They just said, this is your mother. You're going. Um, And so she's trying to teach people how, when certain things that people say, young children say or do is a reason to sit down and have a conversation away from these other parents or so is there something that you could um say that maybe if somebody had asked you certain questions not not your family because let's face it they're probably not going to but if somebody else had asked you questions would they have seen something that made them think to ask questions um I would think so. I mean, I I don't want to say that I'm that good of a like liar. <laughs> I feel like if I was in, if I was like interrogate because I the one thing I was always scared of and probably still to this day is authority. Obviously, so like I followed the authority of my grandpa. I followed the authority of the bishop of our church. I followed the authority. You know what I mean? So if a police officer probably would have asked me, I probably would have said something. I don't know. Um, but because I would probably would have been so scared, but if, but at the same time, I can't, I can't ever think of a time where anyone would have asked me. I mean, okay. So the doctor, when I got to my period, they never asked me, which I always still to this day think is weird. Um, my therapist that I, my parents sent me to when I was young, um, they, cause I would just have screaming fits and which is a total sign right and I was like six seven years old and I was like having just screaming fits the therapist just said to put me in a cold shower um so I he missed the boat on that one I don't know like he didn't think that there was any signs of trauma he just wrote it off as like I was crazy I don't know I was just a bad kid and put me in the shower so I don't know I can't think of like any person that would have been able to maybe, maybe a teacher, maybe if there was a teacher that would have seen something. Um, but like I said, I was really good at masking it, I think. Um, and my mom was the PTA president, the, mm. you know what I mean? The whole nine yards, we looked like very normal. So I just think that. So it was even if they thing. saw something, they may have just put it onto something else without sure. questioning because 
they yeah. look perfectly normal. There's nothing like that going on. Oh, totally. Yeah. 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 There's no way like you're going to, you know, you're going to think that my mom who's like there every day at school or anything like that, that her family was going to be doing something like that, or that I was going through something like that. Even though like I had definite signs, I think I had definite signs. Like when I look back, like if you're, if you're so worried, like I always hung out with all the adults, you know, um, I had a lot of problems with like kids, like kids, because, not a lot, but I would have problems with kids. Um, what do you mean? And, what, well, just what like find like making friends because to this day, like I don't have that many friends from, from being like, I mean, we're like social, but not real friends because I could never tell them the truth. Mm. Right. So like I had to always be like, what I'm always on guard. And if you're always on guard, it's hard to let anybody in. Right. Yeah. So it's very tiring. So I didn't really ever have any like really, really good friends, you know, because I didn't want to ever say anything. Like I didn't want to be embarrassed. I didn't want to anything like that. But there, there are so many incidences. I'm sure that like, there was a time where me and some kids were like messing around and the parents caught us. So at that point, there probably should have been like a, a conversation with everyone. You know what I mean? We were young. We were like six. So there probably should have been a conversation and there wasn't, of course. And so there was a lot of times probably, but nothing happened. I don't know. It's such a weird, it's such a weird thing because even when I talked to people from my church that were, that were there at that time, they were like, how did our parents, why were our parents, where the, where were our parents is more like, it. like, where were they? Because they were just out doing whatever they were doing. And all of us kids were totally not doing what we were supposed to be doing. And we were getting into trouble and all of these things. And the parents were just like, totally clueless. I don't know. They, I don't think they were clueless. I just didn't think they didn't care. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was kind of wondering if there was something like, um, you could help us with. So if we're like seeing some child and everything seems perfect, then I was just curious if there was something that would like let a light bulb moment go off to where you could say, hmm, maybe I need to at least pay attention. Well, I think that anytime they become like distant is probably a big one. Um, Anytime that there's any kind of overreaction that's pretty extreme should be something to look into especially when they're little you know um but probably to be honest a lot of times there's a physical symptom to that kind of stress like I always had stomach aches and I always was like gaining weight and all of these things so and I come from a family that's like I'm the biggest one in the family like everyone's kind of teeny so um that could have been a side like that can be a side I think that there's always a physical sign to that mm-hmm. kind of abuse because there's no way as a kid you can hold it all in right. like I could act normal is you know but then like like all the pain. I mean, I could tell you, I didn't go to school in high school. Like I rarely went to school because I was at home saying I was sick pretty much every day. And my mom was just okay with it. But if she really looked into it again, that's like a sign. Like I was depressed as can be. I didn't want to leave the house, you know, almost typical teenagers, but more extreme because, you know, um, the hugging thing, I've never been able to hug people. So I would say that that's probably a really big one, you know, and any, like, I'm a really big one, like not making my kids hug anyone if they don't want to, because of that, like, oh, you don't want to hug them. You don't have to. I don't care if they're like related or whatever. Yeah. Um, I have a friend that she was abused when she was younger and she's not a hugger either. And I didn't know that when I first met her. Um, And I went to and we had talked, you know, a bunch and everything. And I went to hug her and she said, oh, I don't usually do hugs. She said, but I'll try it, you know, and I gave her a hug. And so I get to hug her. Of course, we don't live close to one another anymore. But she said that, you know, physical touch for her was not was not a comfortable thing for a very, very long time. Yeah, yeah. I would have clients come in and they want to, you know, hug. And I just be like, hugging. and I'd be like, yeah. <laughs> The you do the sideway hug. <laughs> well, and not only that, I'm only five feet tall. So if you're taller than me, my head goes in your chest or whatever. <laughs> that is like 
the worst. <laughs> yeah, experience. yeah. Um, yeah. I'm five one and a half, so I feel you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know. Yeah. And then I and well, and my other thing are, are like men's feet, and I still don't 100 percent understand why men's feet freak me out because I don't I don't think I have all the memory of it, but yeah. if men's feet freak me out so like I can't like I couldn't do pedicures when we went to beauty school like on any men because it just it would freak me out but so I think there's always a physical symptom to it Mm -hmm. Um, I've known some people that have like young girls who have um, lost their hair after after that kind of trauma because it's just so intense you know and I'm, I'm sure that there's lots of other like symptoms, you know, obviously like anything down there that you have, like starting in your period young or, or any kind of like hormonal problems that you have is kind of a given. But for me, I think it would be the touch because like, it's, I was pretty, it was pretty obvious. I, I feel most of the time that it was so uncomfortable. Yeah. That I think that people would notice that, but maybe they just didn't because they just hugged me anyways. And they were just like, whatever, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know? People just would hug you anyways. Her wishes care. don't matter. Yeah. Well, I was too young to really yeah. say, hug me, but I was very uncomfortable. Like, it was like this, you know, like, I'm like, oh, yeah. I don't want to yeah. touch yeah. you, but okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, um, do you want to maybe touch a little bit on the Ayurveda? Because I know you do that along with your fertility stuff, correct? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, I'm not as much as I used to, okay. uh, because I'm just kind of incorporating everything, but like the herbs and, and, um, following the, the, the routines, I think that the routines have probably, I mean, saved me because with DID, like the big thing is just having a really strong routine. So I love the whole aspect of Ayurveda and like having like your, your rituals of like your summer and your, you know, winter and your, and your fall. And, um, I love that kind of stuff. So I do, I do do that. Um, but I can't say that it's as much of, as my protocol as it was when I first went to school for it, Mm -hmm. it's kind of like shifted a little bit. Um, but I do love it. I think that it's, it's very interesting and parts of, parts of, I guess sometimes I have a hard time now trying to figure out which, what my personality is, like which, which dosha this personality is, or this personality is of like where that fits in, in the mental side of things. Yeah. They don't really go into that as much, like the mental, the mental stuff is, is, you know, because I, I don't know, I haven't read up on that as much, but they, they, it's more physical than mental. So for yeah. me right now, I'm concentrating so much on the mental aspect of healing that the physical is very, very limited. Like I just do my, you know, lemon water um, in the morning and certain herbs and stuff like that through, you know, but not as strong. Like I just finished a, a, um, a, a parasite cleanse for the, on the full moon, you know, for the 10 days before stuff like that, but um, not as it's not as much of my protocol now, right now. So what do you typically do for, I'm I'm just trying to make sure I remember um, that you're primarily, I know you work with women that have um, infertility. So is that the basic thing of what you do or is there more to it? Yeah. Um, That's the, where I started and now I'm kind of moving into more intimacy in general because I find that most women that have fertility problems also have intimacy problems so I'm kind of moving more into it doesn't just have to be having a baby you can use the that energy to just heal yourself um, and not use it to have children because right now like for my for my age and and anyone like into their 60s that sexual energy is incredibly potent. And so we can either use it to create a baby or we can use it to create things for change in our life. And so a lot of women, it's like they're, they think, oh, well, I'm going through the change and I, you know, it's just over. I'm I'm just not supposed to want to have sex anymore. And I'm not supposed to want to do any of these things anymore. And I'm, and I'm 
saying, no, you want to keep, you want to keep that energy. You don't want to lose that energy. You want to keep that energy as long as you possibly can. Even if you don't want to have children, it doesn't matter if you want to have children. If you want to be able to be creative and be in your, your feminine energy as long as possible, because it'll actually make you live longer. Right. You know, because we need that energy. And most women, because of the way society is now, we're like, no, I want a hysterectomy. I want to never have my period again. And I don't care. But we don't realize that it 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 makes everything faster. It it speeds up our life expectancy. It it takes away our, our sex game. It does so many things to us that we that we need as women. And I guess that became more of my my drive. The, when I really realized and stepped into the fact that I'm a very sexual human being because of what I went through and that's okay instead mm-hmm. of being a bad thing you know I'm just with my husband I'm okay I'm safe and we explore the whole fact that that energy is very important for for our lives you know and so since I started we started going in into that um, my protocol for my clients has kind of changed because I see myself changing too. Like I'm not necessarily wanting to have any more kids. I could have more kids, but I not necessarily wanting to, but I also don't want to stop where I'm at and stop my cycle or anything like that, because I want to keep my sex drive. I want to keep that sexual energy going. Um, I don't want to lose it, you know, like, yeah, I I agree. So, so that's kind of become more of my thing, mostly because I think because my age, um, the fertility thing was a big thing when I was in my, you know, thirties and I was doing the IVF and all that stuff. And now it's kind of like, well, if you don't want to have a baby, let's still, let's still do this work. Because if you still clean out your womb, you are going to have different orgasms you're going to have different you know feelings come up that you just don't normally feel and why why not do it you know it doesn't have to be to have a child it has to be for just for yourself like to fully like love and embrace and feel your worth for yourself yeah well that sounds amazing i like i it's funny because i spent so much time being you know, in the trauma, like the sexual trauma, but, and then, so then I fought it for so long and then not that long ago, I just realized, no, this is my thing. You know, this is my thing because I understand it from both sides. I understand it from the very darkest, darkest side and to the light and how beautiful it can be, um, you know, doing the whole, doing the whole like Kundalini rising and having your energy move through all your chakras and move it up is a beautiful experience that every woman should strive to want to have because it changes everything inside of you. And it, it actually, that was the first time I ever had that experience. It was the first time that I really, really felt my whole body re-regulate itself like extremely mm-hmm. like it was just you know I would get a little bit here and there when I was like you know oh you, you're masturbating and you get you know whatever but once um once I started to learn about that energy I it rewired my whole nervous system it's it's amazing so I I'm a strong I'm very strong and I used to be like so afraid to say it and now I'm like I'm not I'm not afraid to say it I am a very strong believer in sex energy. Like it is very important and it's more important for women than it is for men because men it's it's external to them. You know, they're, they're things and ours is all internal. We hold it all in. So we hold everything inside of us and we need to let it all out. And so I think it's beautiful. And so it's kind of become more, more of my passion lately than the fertility, but I mean, I still have fertility clients. I have a client that's, you know, doing IVF right now and lots of fun, different things. So it's, it's, it's very, I don't know. It feels good to help women that, you know, have something that they, they need to heal in that area, because I understand that. Yeah. I, I know what it feels like. 
Well, I imagine it's very gratifying once they've gone through your protocol and everything and you see that smile on their face because they were actually able to have an orgasm that they wanted to and that it it felt very different, I'm imagining, from what any that they had had before, if they'd even had any before. Most women only have like external orgasms. They never have internal. So until you've experienced an internal one, like it's so different and like mind blowing that, yeah, like it's, it was like, what, how is this possible? And most women, I, I talk to women, you know, as a hairdresser, you talk to women all day. Right. Um, so I would talk to women all the time and they'd be like, Oh, and I'll, like, I just, it's not my thing. I don't, and I, and I never understood that. Cause I've always loved it. Like I've always needed it, you know, but, and always had a lot of shame. So I would never say that, <laughs> but now I don't care <laughs> because I need it. And that's okay. Like, that's just what it is, you know, but I also know that it's, a, that it can be an amazing, beautiful thing. If you, if you are obviously with the right person and you feel, you have to feel in order to achieve a cervical orgasm, you have to feel a hundred percent safe because a woman cannot open in that place if she does not feel safe. So there is a lot of work to be done just within your relationship in order to achieve that, which is great too. So it's kind of like, oh, well, let's work through this. But then it's also kind of therapy, you know, like me and my husband split up for a time. And when we got back together, our whole thing was, and this is probably going to sound totally crazy, um, was that we would, we would have our conversations with each other while we were having sex. Like for the first few minutes, it was like, you have anything you want to tell me? And <laughs> while we're able, like, and that's how we did it. And it would keep us so that we were calm and that we could rationally yeah. think and stuff. And it was really funny. Like, and it was also went with a like, you had to do it every single day for 21 days. And it was, and we, we did, and it, I mean, it has helped, that helped us so much because it's like, there's nothing, there's probably nothing better than being able to, to talk about something that you want to talk about while you're also enjoying yourself. So it's kind of yeah. like, okay, well, how, how mad could you possibly get it? That, you know, <laughs> yeah, it would take a little bit of the anger away, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and the way that that started was I had watched a, a video about two people that were like therapists and they, they were talking about how when they get when they would fight they in order to fight they would get down on the ground and they would stare each other in the face like this you know and talk like that because it made them feel like they were little kids and they could they could be in a softer place and then you don't have so much whatever and and then in tantra that is part of like a a, a protocol of just you know connecting energetically you know and opening everything up is that you can't have any secrets you can't have any like feelings that are that are not supposed to be there so you have to express them first and you might as well express them while you're like you know in a comfortable position so that's that's the way we do it and it really is life-changing I can't express that enough and it sounds a lot of times when I say it I think oh my gosh I sound like a total pervert because <laughs> because because of how I was raised too. Well, you know? see, now I'm I'm not married anymore. I've been divorced for many, many years. But next relationship, I'm definitely going to be bringing this one. <laughs> right, right. Well, if you start off like that, you will have no issues. I don't think it's like, how can you? you know? Yeah, yeah. You annoyed me today. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> like, I'm okay. All right, let's go to the bedroom. Like, right, exactly. Talk about let's it. Let's talk it out. Let's talk it out. There's no better way than talking it out that way. I don't think it that has been like such a huge shift for our relationship because of that. And now I feel like I just want all couples to know that that's possible and that it's okay to sit there and, and be, you know, emotionally charged and physically charged at the same time and work it out. And it's healthy, you know, it's a healthy way to do it, you know, cause then you don't have this like anger or whatever. For me, it's, the only way or more of a way that my personalities don't come in. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because if I'm physical with my husband, because we have a very safe relationship and I, I feel very safe with him. If I'm being physical with him, I'm a hundred percent in my body. I'm a hundred percent me and no one else. As long as I don't close my eyes, if I close my eyes, 
they all try to come in, you know? So if I keep very like whatever, so for me, it's very good because we, we share eye contact the whole entire time. I'm very in my body. It feels very safe. It's the best way to communicate actually for me. That's wonderful. Well, let me ask you, you said they all try to come in. How many are there? Do you know? Seven. Seven. Mm -hmm. All right. And I think we talked about this before, but I'm sure a lot of the people that are watching this may not are, are listening to this may not have seen that episode, but um, you had, um, if I remember right, you had one that was a, a young girl, the same age as your son, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but then I don't remember anything about the other ones. Um. Well, so I have the first one was, is actually a, See, I don't, I believe that they're an individual. I think I said this in the last one, that they're an individual soul that has stepped in. So they're mm -hmm. considered a walk-in. Um, for me, that's just the best way that I feel the most comfortable with the whole situation. Whether okay. or not that's really real, I don't know, but that's the way I see it. And that's the way I always felt it. So the first one that walked in, that came in was my was my um, great grandma and she protected me so the the new thing that I have learned through the work that I'm doing right now is that because energy is attracted to the same kind of energy and this was really hard for me to come to the realization I just came to the realization not that long ago um, that because it's a trauma event right and you're in trauma and because you're getting a walk-in that's coming in, a soul that's coming in and taking over, the soul that you're attracting is whatever energy that you're at at that moment, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a dark energy most okay. of the time. Um, and unless you ask to be safe, from from what I've gotten from, from my guides and my help and Jesus and God and everyone that I've talked to about this, um, that if you ask to be saved during trauma like that, then an angel will step in and, and something good will step in and help you. Right. And, but if you ask to die, then something demonic or heavy or bad can step in. So in my experience, I only have two that are actually good and the rest are not in my best interest whatsoever. You know what I'm saying? So I think the last time I told you, I sent one, I yeah. made one lead. Mm -hmm. um, and that was definitely like a negative, bad, you know, soul. I don't want to say totally that they're, they're bad, but they're, they're, they're not for my best interest. They're, right. they're, they're Which they were in the beginning. They were, they, well, they so protect you. Yeah. They yeah. protect you. But at the same time, they have probably their own agenda of, of, confusion and manipulation and taking over you at the same time because okay. they come in and they're they're attracted to that bad situation and they help hide that bad situation but then they also help make you feel that energy all the time when they're present so like when she was present my energy was definitely like psychotic and crazy and angry and all of those things that she is do you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. so and that's the one you got rid of, right? Yes. That's okay. the one I, I have told to leave. And the other two, I have two that are good. And we, so then the other five, but then she's, you know, not her, but so the, the other four, they're all negative entities. So it was really hard for me to admit. Um, that's why I'm saying like, this is just a new thing that I've discovered lately. I used to always say, oh, well, they they came in and they protect me, right? They, they protect me so they can't be bad. But the truth is, if I believe in the law of attraction and I believe in energy and I believe that at that moment, I was in such a place of, you know, deep anger, fear, you know, everything that the, the entity that stepped in to protect me, it would be the same as that energy that I was, right? It can't step into me if I'm light and good and happy. A dark one wouldn't be able to, but also a light one wouldn't be able to step into me if I'm dark and heavy and wanna die. Uh, they're just not gonna, they're not gonna come, you know? And so that was really hard for me to see until just recently. Just recently, I realized that 
really none of them are good for me. They, even though I think, oh, they protect me and they've, they've done all this stuff, neither, n- none of them really have my best interest at heart. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. They're there. They do what they do. They have more control sometimes than I have control, obviously. And it's always been lying, you know, manipulative, um, narcissistic. I mean, I definitely at times have been that. Um, all, all the things that are bad have, I don't want to say that I'm perfect. So that would sound weird, but all the pieces <laughs> that are, are like, you know, the really negative things are coming from, from that, those, those beings. So I can't really say that they, they protect you, but, but then make you and make you feel like you're protected, but then also give you traits that are incredibly bad, like not good, I guess I, I would mm-hmm. say. So that was just something I just really figured out lately with a lot of meditation prayer and realize that even though they've, they've made me not be able to see the things that I see and do all of these things all the time. Um, I, I really don't want them anymore. Like, like if I could tell them all to go, I would tell them all to go because they, none of them serve my, my highest good. None of them let me be who I really am um, all the time because it's, they'll just step in, you know, whenever they feel the need or anytime that I'm triggered, they step in. And I used to think, oh, well, that's good. They step in, they help me with the trigger, but not if my reaction by them is like something crazy, you know, that doesn't right. really work. And so when I told her to leave, I really realized that that's when I saw it. I said, oh, okay. So all these things that I have that are coming from these other four, like the narcissism and all of these other things that are like the sex addict and all all of those issues, those are coming from the other four that are, and they're not, they're not in my best interest. They're there almost like oh, we have control and we're manipulating and their, whatever their agenda is, is different than my agenda. So I don't know if that makes sense, but that's the way I've seen so the, it. So the two that you have that are more of a positive nature, what are they? Um, both, all my, all my walk-ins are female, thank mm-hmm. goodness, um, because I don't know what I would do. I mean, I have one that's a lesbian, so I guess that could, you know, um, but so she lives more in her masculine, like, a lot but the rest um the 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 other two they came early at the gate so so when 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 I hit a certain age I just wanted to die like I didn't want to go through it anymore I just wanted to die and so the ones that came later in my life are all really pretty negative and bad um the ones younger like when I was six and seven like those those two they're they're just you know one is my great grandma one is a young girl they're they're very shy she's very shy she doesn't really come around at all really um and the other ones are the ones that are like the really in charge and they're much more dominant and my other two like they they sit back the majority of the time um they're more emotional they're more they're probably closer to me, I guess. I don't know. Like maybe that's what it really is, is they're just closer to what, who I really am. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, but I didn't ask to die at those times, which to me is significant in the whole game because the times that I asked to die, those ones are the ones that are, that are like, they still want me to die. Do you know what I mean? They're here to like, to, protect me but not protect me they still want me to like do their bidding and do their their things I guess kind of um make me do things that I wouldn't my my personality wouldn't normally do um so but so if you were able to get rid of that one can you not just one by one so I strongly believe that I could get rid of all of them um because of because of all the work that I've done in the meditations and all of those things that I've done, I have been told that, that I could get them to go away. I have had religious people tell me that they could make them go away. Also that I could get like a, you know, deliverance type of thing or whatever mm-hmm. and get, and get the demons out. Um, 
because at this point I kind of would consider them some kind of like entity that's a you know a demon type of thing I guess I'm okay with that like I'm okay with the fact that I can say I live with demons inside of me. I've also had demons inside of me, men that were demons. Like the whole thing go is is the same. So it doesn't it doesn't hurt me to say that anymore. Before, like not that long ago, I would have never been able to say, oh, well, I'm, you know, possessed by demons or I have these personalities that are really bad things because that would make me like feel like I'm a bad person. Now I've separated myself so much from them. It's like, well, they are what they are and I am what I am. And I think that eventually I could get them to go. But at the same time, I'm not really worried about it because the more I'm in my body, the less control they have. And I don't seem to get triggered as much. And I don't seem to have them be able to come in as much. If I just stay really present and in my body, then they, then they don't have as much power anyways. And I think that that's a big thing. If we were teaching people that had disassociation to stay in their body, instead of like having their personalities come out and do it for TikTok and think it's fun and all that kind of stuff. Then, do people do that? Oh yeah. There are real? channels of, of oh. kids that just are showing their just, and it's like, well, you really want to just stay in your body. If you just stayed in your body, they can't come. So do that instead. And that's where the real power is, is like not letting them come, you know? Um, so hmm. I don't I know. No I, idea. Yeah. And it's become a thing, I guess. And I was really shocked because I, because I had a therapist tell me that that was a thing. And I thought, so I went online and I was looking and I'm like, well, I don't, I don't look like that when I change. And then I saw a lot of other people that were the same way. They don't look like they change. They don't change and look like anything. They just, you know, they're just whatever. They might talk a little bit different. Um, I've had my eyes. People have said things happen to my eyes sometimes. Um, sometimes I, I definitely have a different um, kind of an accent for, for one of them. So, but not, it's not huge, but I do. Uh, I definitely have a sailor's mouth for one of them. Like if I'm cussing off the wall, you know <laughs> that she is there because that's not my like normal, normal, you know? So it's weird. And, and then food cravings. Sometimes I'll have certain food cravings with certain ones, which is really weird because I'll be like really good, like on my diet or whatever. And like just really good. And then all of a sudden everything is like, you know, a piece of toast with butter on it and I have to have it like like crazy you know so it's so weird because it's like well, this, I don't even want this but I know but I want it yeah so it's really <laughs> so. well I've even heard of some people that have the multiple personalities and one of them has to wear glasses one of them doesn't and mm -hmm. you know and to me and I know this is totally off subject but that to me means that your eyes are not the issue. It's your brain about your eyes when you have to wear glasses and stuff. Because if one personality, the same damn eyes, doesn't need to wear glasses, I don't know. I'm, I'm getting no. off topic, but that's no, just I, one of the things I, I, think, I think of. I think that that's true too, because there are times when I have a certain personality that's the older, the older grandma, and I feel like I can't see as good. You know, I don't put glasses on because it's just like an ego thing. I think. I'm like, I don't need them. I don't need them. I don't want them yet. But I think that that's what it is. You know. Yeah. It changes mind. You know, like they they have control of everything. It's really weird. They have control. It's like you're sitting back there, and sometimes I I'll feel like I'm screaming, trying to like say no, I don't want to do this, or no, I want to like, um, I don't want to make that decision. You know. Uh, lately, my thing is when they're, when they're taking over is to try to like say a prayer, like my inner child will say a prayer so that I can try to like come back to myself, you know, like, and get that discernment from who's in charge right now. Like, yeah, I'm in charge, you know, like, it's hard to like know who's in charge. And, and I used to think, oh, well, they're saving me. It's okay. Like, it's okay. They're like, they're doing it, but I don't think that way anymore. I think that I have to save myself and that they need to go away. Like I need to be able to do it myself. I used to think, oh, it's okay that they came in to protect me and they're still going to protect me and they're still going to save me now. And now I think, no, I have to do it myself. Like I need them to go, you know? And I think that they go, me personally, my, my thought is that the more that I'm present, they'll just have to go because they just, they can't live with me. Right. They can't, they can't live attached to me if 
my if, energy. If they're always in the background. Yes. If they're, why would they want to, you know? Yeah. Like, well, you know, I was not- going to ask that. So, cause I'd ask you if you were, why didn't you just make them all go? If you could get that one to go, but what you were saying is that, you know, you through meditation and different things that you're doing to heal yourself, that they come out less and less. So from what you're saying, if I'm understanding correctly, is that as you're healing and everything, maybe they'll just start dropping off one by one by one. I think so. I think so. And a lot of it does. Like when I told the the one to leave a lot of it, that, that week that I was really doing, I was doing a lot of work on that area of my life. And I went through refeeling the whole into so in order to heal my trauma I've had to refeel all of the experiences that I had and integrate them into my body because they stopped me from feeling it you know I wasn't allowed to feel it or see it or experience it really in real time like it's kind of in the back you know back of your mind not like up front so in order to heal from it I have to re feel it and go through the whole entire experience again. And I went through the whole entire experience of when she stepped in, I, I felt it all. I I went through all of it again. And that was when I was really like, okay, well, I don't need you to protect me from this situation anymore because I'm, I'm fine. Like I'm healed. So you have to go because I don't need you and you're not serving me. And I, and, and that, so I think that they will go away. Honestly, I, I think that And I also, I want to say this. I also think that like, it just might be my mind and the fact that I think that I can do it versus like, maybe other people are just like, well, I'm just stuck with them and I'm just going to live with them forever. My mind is saying, no, I don't have to live with this forever. I can heal myself. Like that trauma doesn't get to have control over me forever. Like I have to heal from it. There there has to be a way, you know, there has to Mm -hmm. be a way to not have this forever because some people hurt me when I was a child like they don't get to be inside of me and be whatever forever like that's just not that's not fair right like I I get to if I do the work I get to move on from this part of my life and and not have this these issues because of it right that should be just and just like healing your body physically like if you do the work like your body's going to heal right so it's the same thing like if I'm doing the work then they like they have to let me go I guess I don't know like that's just the way I look at it like I think okay and maybe I just think I have more control than I really do <laughs> that works well, we're just gonna me. go with the assumption <laughs> that you do have control um yeah, yeah. so because <laughs> who knows right so yeah, you just right, have to put that energy out there yes. and so yes. let's go with um let me ask you so who will Brianne be when she no longer has these personalities that are stepping in and um taking over at different times who will you be oh my gosh that's I don't I honestly I, half the time I don't know I will definitely be someone that's very passionate about um intimacy uh energy work um fertility work because those things have healed me in such a, a strong way that though that definitely will never go away trauma meditation um and a mom which a lot of my life I fought against and then became a mom and still kind of fought against so like that um in a wife I don't I don't even know I I don't mind telling my story so I probably you know talk about it and mm-hmm. you know maybe be a speaker but it's hard. Cause I, I don't know. It's hard to say like, cause it takes me, there are days when I'm disassociated and it's really hard to do anything. You know what I mean? Like I have to spend so much time on myself. It's very, it becomes almost a vain, a vain thing where I have to stare at myself in the mirror and like actually see myself versus see all the other things, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, so sometimes it takes longer than others to to be, I don't know, normal. I don't even, I can't say well, that. Who's normal. normal. Right, exactly. <laughs> hey, be, I, I don't have multiple personalities. Like 
I don't have multiple personalities that I know of, but I still have to do shadow work all the time right? because yeah. I have, and you know, we all say that thing. Well, part of me wants to do this and part of me wants to do that, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it's not the same thing, but it's similar and that it, we've got you know something what? else in our mind saying, nope, this is better. That's better. This, is better. Yeah. you just have to yeah. discern. I think it's very similar to be okay. honest, and I, but I also believe that more people have walk-ins than you could ever imagine because we just think that it's uh like you said a part of me wants to do this and a part but actually if you've had a trauma the chances of you having a walk-in is very great because they use that negative energy oh no what I can hear you. You're still there. Oh, you can hear me. You can't yeah. see me though, right? I can see you. Oh, you can't. How weird. It went black. <laughs> um, they do well, not like what I'm saying right now. That's right. We can see you. You can't see okay. us. <laughs> okay. Um, they do not. They like that energy. They feed off of that energy, that trauma energy. So I. Oh, and there she went. Or maybe I did. Nope, we're still recording. So obviously somebody didn't like what was going on. So let me see if I can find out where she's at and get her back. Hmm, isn't that interesting? So let's see, I just sent her a text message. We'll see. We're kind of going over anyway, so it might be a good place to stop. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop right here. Um, and then maybe we can get her on another time to finish up this fascinating conversation because I really want to hear a lot more about how shadow work as I know it can be so similar to what she's dealing with. But so thank you all for being here and being part of this podcast. And um, remember, um, I share this on my YouTube. So whether you're YouTube or on any of the podcast platforms, just make sure you share, you like, subscribe, leave a message, leave a comment, leave anything that you can do to help grow this channel. Because my goal is to have some amazing people on here and share their stories out into the world. So with that said, oh, wait a minute. There she is. Let's see. Let's see what we can get her back on. I don't know what happened to my computer. So that's I'm okay. Now... I was just, I thought, well, we'll go ahead and end here. So I was just going ahead and telling everybody, but there you are. Cause I said, I'm I was really curious. Phone. Do what? I'm now on my phone because I don't know what happened to my computer. Computer it just decided to hmm. not work. I yeah. know. that's that energy right. coming out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, if you do, you have anything else that you want to say about the? Because you were right in the middle of saying something about the oh, shadow work yeah. and stuff. Yeah, I do believe that a lot of people that have trauma that they have walk-ins that they don't even know that they have, and so I think that. A lot of times we do all the shadow work and, oh, we've done all our work on all our ancestors and we've done our, our, you know, shadow work and we've done our past lives even, but we don't look to see if there is some kind of something in from the trauma that has attached to us. So how because, would they know that? Um, I think that meditation is usually the best way to come through it. Like when you're, when you're in meditation with yourself, really, really with yourself and then you ask certain questions, you know, before or after. Like um, well, you talk about your trauma, like you ask questions about your trauma, like okay. what happened. You can just ask. I, I, I'm a big believer that I don't think that they can hide that from you, um, that they have to almost disclose it kind of like that they have, you, you have to know. So if you ask if anything has come into me during that mm -hmm. trauma, then then I think that you'll, you'll find out. I think that's the best way to do it is just to ask. Okay. Um, and you'll know, cause if you ask yourself, your body will probably tell you, 
because they usually are, are held in a certain area. Like I think I told you before, like um, I have the one that's in my shoulder, right? Like that, that every time I ask a question of it, my shoulder shrugs, I have no control over it whatsoever. It's just the weirdest, you know, thing that's just, it lives in my shoulder, you know? Um, and so I think that if you ask, you'll know, and, and you'll yeah. probably be able to find out where they're at, but that's, I, to me, that's something that I think that's kind of missed. I don't know, is that, that, you know, if you've had something traumatic, you might not have seven or you might not have, there's some people that have, I mean, a, a lot, you know, um, 20, you know, but you might just have one that has attached to you. The other thing that people don't talk about with trauma, especially sexual trauma, is that you also create a cord with a person that like that sexually abused you so that needs to be cleared also and that's a big part of like any kind of like fertility or intimacy or most I don't know any kind of energy work for like females is clearing all that Mm -hmm. that's yeah I do that um cord cutting a lot when I do like some past life regressions with my hypnosis Um, Mm -hmm. and then we will, we will cut different cords that need to be cut, but you know, cause we always make sure that they see all the cords that are there and they make the cords that are a negative or need to be gone. They make them a different color. So they only cut the ones that they don't need to keep. Yeah. 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 That's beautiful. I think that that's so beautiful because it's like, you don't think about it especially even just like if you have sex, if, if there's someone that's had sex with a lot of people, I'm always like, Oh, we got to take care of that first. You know, like you're trying to have a baby, but you've had multiple partners. You don't want their, you don't want their energy inside of you. You don't want any of that stuff inside of you there. You know, you have a connection with them and you have to get rid of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's one part of the, the church that I always think about now is I think, well, they, they would talk about only having sex with like, you know, just the person you're married to. And I, and not that I think that that's totally right, but like sacred union is very important. I think in the whole act of, of sex and the sexual energy. And so I think that, oh, okay, well, churches sometimes have part of it, right. But then they have all the shame and the, the worst stuff that, that doesn't yeah. help it makes it yeah. worse. Yeah, I agree. Well, We've gone over a little bit, but this has yeah. definitely been fascinating. I've loved every second of it. So, um, you know, and I think I could talk to you forever. I don't know what it is, but it's like, you, you, <laughs> it's like we just keep on talking. Right. Um, but um, I will go ahead and say uh, thank you so much for being here and for popping back on when things happened. And um, I just, I just love you. You've got such an amazing energy about you and presence. And, um, I just feel like I've known you forever, even though we've never even met in person. And, uh, so, so I, I appreciate you greatly for being here. And is there, there's one question that I've started asking, um, my, my guest at the end, and I'm going to go ahead and ask this for you. And I, I wouldn't think it would be a trigger. So let's hope not. Um, but, what would you like for people to remember about you or say about you when you, when you're no longer with us? Um, Probably that she, or that I, um, that I never gave up, Mm. that I, that I worked through everything that I possibly could. And I tried everything to be like, you know, healthy and, and happy. And even with like everything that happened, like I just, I didn't give up or that I just didn't give a, you know what? And I, and I said it all and who like, you know what I mean? Like one of the two, <laughs> she's just a bitch and she fought it and she told everyone's stories and she's just, you know, a blabbermouth <laughs> that, or she just never gave up one of the two. <laughs> Both are fine. Both are really fine. All right. Well, you know, it'll what'll happen is there'll be one camp that says one and one camp that says the other. So you'll get your wish. (laughs) (laughs) That is just beautiful. So thank you so much for sharing that. And um, I look forward to chatting again. Yeah. Thank you for having me.